Hi, this is Michael Feigen. Um, I'm a patent attorney, as you well know. Uh, my website, you can find me at patentlawny.com, or if you're in New Jersey, you can find me at patentlawnj.com. And if you're in Pennsylvania, patentlawpa.com. Uh, we have locations in New York, Passaic, New Jersey, Philadelphia, and also Allentown. Uh, what we do is primarily uh, patent prosecution, that's obtaining patents. Uh, we also do trademark work as well as copyrights and other assorted internet related things, but then the um, meat and potatoes of what I do personally is patent prosecution. It's filing the patents and getting them issued. Uh, I'm speaking here on March 14th, today is officially Pi Day, and it is the uh, one year birthday of my youngest daughter who celebrated by keep staying up all night and partying. So I'm a little tired here today, but that's okay. A um, year ago when she was born, also on Pi Day, we tried to, oh, it's coming out, she was born little, like 11.10. We tried to, the doctor and I were discussing what times that she could be born at that we could make it 3.14159. My wife wasn't very happy about the discussion, hasn't forgiven me to this day. But in any case, one of the other side points of getting a um, patent attorney giving a speech is I'm probably the only attorney who runs Linux, so the presentation was actually made in Linux, and when they imported it into PowerPoint, some of the um, uh, formatting is a tiny bit off, but the information is all still there. Content's what matters. It has, all the content is there. Welcome. We have some in the live audience today, but most people are listening by webcast. So let's get started. There on slide one, you can see there's my phone number, there's my website again, patentlawny.com. And today's talk, we are going to give an introduction, which you are currently in the midst of. Uh, then we're going to talk about drafting the patent application with the office action in mind. Because primarily today what we're talking about is not drafting the patent application, but how to respond to the patent office. Because typically what happens is you file a patent application and they typically give a rejection. So we want to draft it in a way that we're going to hopefully preempt at least some of the more common rejections, or hopefully every rejection. But um, at the end of the day, they tend, tend to always give rejection, so we're going to talk about how to deal with that because that's where the real being an attorney comes in. Uh, so then we're going to talk about, in three, the non-prior art type rejections, which is abstract and those type of things. Uh, then the prior art rejections, which are 35 USC 102 and 35 USC 103. Prior art rejections refer to when they cite other references against you either in one reference is a 102 or two or more references is a 103 obviousness type rejection because they mass two or more things together. Then there's an examiner interview, um, devoting a section to that, talking to the examiner, negotiating claims with them, and r finally writing your written response to the office action. Um, also, please feel free to send in questions. Uh, you can send them in on the web or if you're in person, uh, raise your hand, uh, preferably after a slide, like just when I flip into another slide, and I'll be happy to answer questions and encourage them because I'll know if I'm being clear if you can um, ask me questions and we can talk further about it. Um, okay, so the introduction section, I'd like to actually start by saying that, how many, well, you're just going to go in the studio audience as I say on TV. I've never really been in a studio audience, but here we are. Actually, that's not true. I went to a Conan O'Brien show once. Uh, but in any case, um, how many here watch Shark Tank? Okay, we got like half of the audience here watching Shark Tank. That's good. How many here saw where Mark Cuban bid on the guy that draws cat drawings? No one saw that episode. Okay, Shark Tank is one of two kosher TV programs. Is <laughs> I actually watch, the other one being Mythbusters, which I actually watch with my kids. But anyway, Shark Tank... Um, the, he actually bid on a guy who for $9.95 draws a cat for you. I want to draw a cat for you dot com. And Mark Cuban actually bid on this. And every thousandth cat, he draws for, he draws for, uh, it, Mark Cuban draws it. So I actually have here a cat drawing that Mark Cuban drew for me. Now, the reason I bring this up is because it's kind of cool. It's my claim to fame that Mark Cuban drew a cat for me. You know, that's the closest I'm going to come to, you know, whatever, but a billionaire drew a Hat for me. I mean, like, how ridiculous is that? I have a blog post about that on my website, which uh, you can read all about it. It does wonders for my search engine marketing, but <laughs> just the real reason I did it. But in any case, Mark Cuban happens to, um, I'll talk about him a little more since he was kind enough to draw a cat for me. Mark Cuban happens to hate patents. He says that they, they kill industry and they have tons of uh, money spent on them and so forth. 
And to a degree, I mean, I think he has a point, but I actually said he had to write something positive about patents if he was going to draw the cat for me. So he wrote hooray for patents, but then he put a question mark explanation point. So anyway, this is pretty cool. You can all come up and touch it in ooh and ah later. But I just thought I'd mention that because I didn't have any good patent attorney joke, so I thought this was better. Because anyone hear a good patent attorney joke? Um, me either. They're just, we're not that funny. OK, <laughs> quick background of the process now that we're over with um, the fun part, we'll get down to the um, less fun part. Background of the process of patent prosecution. So we're over here in uh, the, ar the arguments and amendment part. So first part is the inventor disclosure. Basically, an inventor comes to you. I actually have someone in the audience here who came to me for a search. And then what we did was, we, we, I understand what his concept is. We do a novelty search, and we want to find the closest references that are out there. Reason being because we want to make sure it's patentable. We want to find the references that hopefully the patent office is going to find before they do. Now, there's another school of thought that says just go and file it and don't do that because you have to disclose anything you find. And it might work against you. And if they don't find it, hey, you have a patent. I'm basically not in that school of thought. I prefer to do the search, get the uh, full results. And then based on those results that we have, we tailor the claims towards what we have. Because we want to tailor the claims around getting a rejection. Now in this particular case where I did the search, we found some very close references. So we have to work around it. We have to find something different. And that's basically the way it works. We want to find something that we can patent. Um, the uh, regular TV show view of an inventor is they come with this great idea. And it's wonderful. And it's all new. And this is a lot of people come into my office. This is the best idea ever. And they say, oh, it's going to make millions. A person comes to my office and says, I know it's going to make millions. Let's try and refrain from rolling my eyes in front of them. Because it means that they're not in reality. Because the reality is, even if you have the best idea in the world, even if you've solved cold fusion, you're going to have to bring the thing to market and make it work. It's not that easy. And even if it's a great idea, you have to try and sell it to somebody. Maybe if you cold fusion, you can probably sell that one. But most things are not like that. Um, so people tend to sort of get caught up in their ideas and think it's wonderful, so my job is to hopefully bring them back down to earth. Which is, on the flip side, the evil side of the industry, is the invention promoters, which you can see on my website, again, patentlawny.com. I have a whole article there about how I actually went in with a client to one of these promoters that promises these guys the world if you just pay them to all their marketing and all that, everything else. They sort of go on your dreams and say, hey, this is a wonderful idea, where sometimes I'll tell them it's a bad idea, don't go forward. And at the end of the day, I like to think I'm the one that sleeps at night. So uh, anyway, we draft the application. We file it. It's examined by the patent office. And uh, then we have the arguments and amendments, which is what we're primarily going to talk about is dealing with the patent office back and forth until you get it issued. And you get your patent, and then it doesn't end there. This is the government's second biggest money maker after the IRS. So you pay maintenance fees the fourth, eighth, and twelfth year to keep your patent in force. I talked about that so much today. We're going to talk about the types of things you see at the patent office. Here is just a warm-up example till we get into the more fun parts. This is an actual claim of an application. If you saw my talk I gave last year, this is the same one I gave last year because it doesn't get much crazier than this one that I gave. So the claim of the application was a device of claim one, wherein said blah, 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 is not important, device is coupled to a neutral wire. The office action, this is now the response from the patent office examining this claim, where you have a device coupled to a neutral wire, see Hart 5B. No further explanation. Presumably, he means figure 5B of Hart. So OK, fine, I can figure that out enough. You often have to read between the lines of the, some of these office actions if they're not written well. I should say some are written very well, some are written very poorly. It really depends on the examiner you get. And lately, they've been trying to decrease the backlog, which means decreasing the amount of time examiners have to work on a case, and they're just ridiculously overburdened. But anyway, figure 5B, current signal. It's just kind of a sine curve or cosine curve, maybe. I can't read from here where the zero is, nor do I remember my trigonometry from high school, which I should. Probably shouldn't be admitting that on video when I'm a patent attorney. But in any case, the sine curve started one or the cosine? Anybody? OK, I don't feel so bad. All right, <laughs> easy enough to look up. Google, you can look it all up. Um, so at a telephone interview, the examiner refuses to discuss it. He really refused to discuss any of the claims except for this one broad claim that I had. So it was so bad, and the supervisor I was like, on, I just 20 minutes back and forth, I said, let's talk about it. You know, This claim, claim seven, 
Where do you see neutral wire in your sine and or cosine curve? And he said, we don't have enough time to examine the implications. Sorry, 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 blah, blah, blah. Eventually, I got this patent through. Again, you can look at my website. I've got a couple dozen patents through so far since I went out into private practice on my own, started in my own firm. And you can see this there. And <laughs> we did eventually get this claim through because it just was not cited in the prior art. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There's neutral wires all over. But the patent office must cite it. If they do not cite it, then the rejection is not good. The burden is on the examiner to support the rejection. Any questions? OK. All right, so how do you draft your patent application? Because we want to draft it in a way which will hopefully overcome rejection. So we want to have in mind uh, what's out there in the prior art. What, is, what are the other things doing? What are, what are other people um, working on? So the first part that we do is consider how they're going to actually look at your patent application. Now, since they are so pressed for time, and the patent, I'm assuming that people have a little bit of understanding of patents here. So I'm not speaking at a very basic level on what is a patent, what does it get you. It gets you basically a 20-year monopoly where, well, the 20-year, OK, I'm speaking on this. Um, the government gives you 20-year uh, limited duration monopoly. That was redundant. 20 year monopoly on your invention. 20, right now, for a utility patent, it's 20 years from date of filing. Basically, I look at it like this, and this analogy works too well that every time I give it, I'm more and more convinced of it. That the government is a monopoly. It's kind of like the mafia. Mafia has a monopoly on the Lower East Side. You want to do business there, you pay the protection fee. If not, the government doesn't break your legs per se, but anyone else can take it and then uh, and they're not going to stop them. Maybe they just don't care about you. But if you give them the fee and go through this process and you pay the protection fee, they will give you protection on the Lower East Side and they will break the legs of anyone else who copies you, anyone else who opens up their competing pizza store. So you patent your pizza store, so to speak, and you file your patent. And it doesn't actually give you a right necessarily to do anything, but it gives you the right to sue others. You can now use the government's monopoly to sue other people and get the government's force behind you to stop other people from copying you. And it's kind of anti-competitive, but the idea is that if you disclose this, even though it's quote unquote anti-competitive, as Mark Cuban will point out quite readily, hooray for patents, question mark. It is true it's anti-competitive, but the flip side of the coin is it hopefully spurs innovation by having you disclose things. I get clients that come to me all the time. I can't get a patent. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to be knocked off. So if somebody really has a new and wonderful technology, they're not going to bring it out. So they go and patent it, and uh, now they'll bring it out, and they have to disclose everything about how they do it. And that's the cool part, because now, hopefully, our science and technology advances. Uh, and now the United States Mafia gives you control over the United States. Now, if you want protection in Canada, you got to go pay the mafia over there. So you give them their protection fee over in Canada. And each country is its own little, well, own big uh, area of protection. And uh, they work together. So it's kind of like the Lower East Side Mafia boss works with the Upper West Side Mafia boss and says, OK, you know, you gave protection to that guy. That's fine. We'll extend that protection over here for another fee. That's how it works. You file in, in the United States and then want to go to Canada, that type of thing. Anyway, back to the slide at hand. So when we draft our patent application with that in mind, going for that end goal of getting that protection, is keep in mind examiners will read the claims a little more. The claims are what protect your, what claims your territory. You get your homestead. Now you're taking this intellectual property. I don't work with real property. It's too messy and dirty and um, unethical in many respects. Um, in the, here, I just create it. Like, OK, great, I don't want to get my hands dirty. We just create the property. So it's like you get that little homestead, that 100-acre homestead that the government then gives you when you get your patent issued. And the meets and bounds of it are defined by your claims. So your claims are what spell out, like we had given another example, claims having the neutral wire, which assuming you're the first one to do neutral wire, that's great. Or if it's added to something where it's not obvious to do it, that is your claim. That's what you have. So. Oftentimes, the first thing examiners will do is find terms, like if you say the word substantially, they will reject it. They'll say, I don't know what substantially means. It's indefinite. So you have to use definite claim language. You, ha you can't say, where I use something which is uh, s uh, substantially circular. So I don't know what substantially means, so we're going to interpret that you mean exactly circular, nothing else. So how do you get around that? You define it. 
Where is a circle with an aspect? Uh, it's substantially circular means a circle with an aspect ratio between 0.9 and 1.1 or something to that extent. And you have backup terminology and variations in the specification in case you need to amend it. So for example, suppose they reject your claim of substantially circular and they find it. Well, maybe I have another thing where I say it's oval and I define oval as having the aspect ratio of at least 1.4, something to that extent. And now I can just amend my claim or I can amend in the definition because what will happen is they'll read the claim, they'll say substantially circular, this is substantially circular. And I'll say, no it's not, look how I defined it. And oftentimes the easiest thing to do is just say in your claim, wherein it's substantially circular with an aspect ratio between 0.9 and 1.1. Now I'm not sure what kind of technology uses a circle and, you know, with that, that bounds, but it's just to illustrate the point that you can have your definition in your write-up of the patent application so you can bring it in later. It's a common way of getting around uh, rejections which aren't that good, which unfortunately they tend to happen and you won't be able to convince the examiner or not because they'll say, well, I can read into that, this circle. And you can say, okay, I'll just change the claim language. Uh, and then you can find those things by using signals and precise language in your office, in your specification to put into your office action. So for example, you might say the words alternate embodiment or even better, defined as. Um, I now use the word defined as all over the place because I had cases a while ago where, you, where I'd say things like, uh, the, this is, for example, this can be A, B, or C. And the examiners would say, well, that's an example. I can still read in D because you just gave examples. It's not limited to that. So now I say defined as A, B, or C. And you're kind of limiting the scope of it a little bit, but that's okay because you can put in an alternative embodiment. You can use D. And you can put that in a dependent claim. So it's sort of that strategy of how you draft your claims um, in order to um, uh, in, in order to be able to get around potential rejections and the strategy of using the 20 claims that you're given in a patent application where you start with your independent broadest claim and go dependent where they get uh, narrower and narrower claims in order to give all of those different variations because you don't know which ones are going to get through and as good as your prior art search is there's eight and a half million patents almost and they don't necessarily even need to cite patents. Um, I've gotten citations from the Japanese Patent Office. I've gotten citations from various literature or scientific journals or publications, anything, because in order to get a patent, you have to be new and unobvious over everything out there. Okay, so now we're going to into the, the application. The background section of the patent application is the first part of it. This is where you spell out what, what's, well, put it this way, it's optional. You don't need to spell out anything. But generally, you spell out what the problem is. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? It gives the reader sort of an idea of what they're about to read. So I tend to use these to sell your invention to the examiner, which I think is fairly common practice, is that you will basically say, the problem in the industry is that belt buckles are, tend to warp the belt. So uh, this has been a problem, and here's the uh, here, here's all of the belts that are out there, here's a discussion of some of them, and they all have this problem. So there is a need in the art to solve this problem. What I would not say in the background is say, this problem uh, could be solved by making the belt stronger, by reinforcing the belt. Or I wouldn't cite references that even if they're not belts, I wouldn't cite a reference to a car part where they reinforce the seat belt or something over there because then it might be obvious to combine the two. Anything you say in the background can be used against you. It, it can be considered admitted prior art. So there's some attorneys just won't write a background section. I'm not one of them, but that opinion is out there. Just don't bother. You don't need it. It can only hurt you. But I think you can use it to sell the invention and direct the reader towards what it is because maybe if the examiner has time and reads more than the claims, he'll read the background to hopefully figure out, understand what he's reading. Because sometimes you just go to the claims it's can't even under, un, well, it's, it's very difficult to understand without having context. So it sort of provides the context. The summary um, is also it's technically optional, but it's only always used, almost always used. This tracks the claim language in plain English. We don't use legalese. We use, well, we use something closer to English in the summary. Um, we don't use words like comprising because those have a precise definition in patents. And the good part about the summary is in, in anything in your claims has to have support in your write-up. So if you take everything in your claims, 
write it into the summary in plain English. In case somehow you miss something in the claims then this is a, that you didn't put in your detailed description, this is a backup to make sure that you have a description there in your summary to make sure everything is there and you can sort of elucidate a little. Sometimes I go and explain, give definitions, rewrite it in regular sentences uh, in order to have a full summary and it's often the thing that a judge or jury is going to read when they determine infringement because they can't read the claims or they're much more difficult to read so they'll read the summary to get an idea of it. Litigation is a whole other ball game. Um, if I may do, do this backwards, if I, can, if I can ask you a question because you said you do patent litigation. <laughs> You're supposed to ask me the questions, but in, in patent litigation, what do you find is most, uh, what do you find like the judge and jury reads? Um, the summary, background, and the claims last. Yeah, okay. So there you have affirmation, so someone actually does litigation. I do patent prosecution, not litigation. So that they will read the background to get an idea of what they're reading, the summary, which is hopefully more English, and then they'll try and figure out the claim. So it's sort of the roadmap that points them to the claims. Okay, then you get to the drawings. Drawings, um, I'm going to quote from, uh, oh man, what's his name? Gene Quinn. He's a patent attorney. He gives continuing education courses also. He actually teaches patent bar courses. And he says, drawing is worth a thousand words. He says something to the extent of, in a patent, that's underrated. <laughs> it's worth a lot more than a thousand words. Because anything that you, you, that you need to bring in, um, I'll give an example. I have a patent, again, not to plug my website more, but I'm plugging my website more. You can look at this patent on my website. It's a pacifier weeding device. I got this patent issued where it's a pacifier where the nub starts, here I'm going to, for sake of the camera, I'm going to blow this up about 20 times. The nub starts like this, and then each of the six pacifiers gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so you change it out. Um, that would not work on my three-year-old because she would immediately know. She says, I want the blue passy. We give her the blue passy. She says, no, the other blue passy. So three in the morning is not so fun. Anyway, she wasn't the child up last night, though. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> so, but for the kids, if this does work, and the idea is you get a smaller and smaller nub. The examiner found prior art. I had found some. He found some more that cited, or actually, I'm sorry, it was Europe. They found the prior art. It was a European search. They had found it. And um, we had to, I was trying to get around that because it was different. In that reference, what did they do? They didn't make the whole nub smaller. They actually pulled the nub be into, be behind. It was one pacifier where they pulled it behind to make it smaller because more of it now was behind the backsplash plate thing. It has a technical name, which I knew when I wrote the patent. But um, in any case, so we had to get around that. So I said, well, that was just changing the lathe, not the circumference. Problem was, I hadn't disclosed circumference in there because I hadn't seen that prior art reference because you know you can never see absolutely everything out there. Uh, and uh, since I didn't have words to define circumference, examiner interpreted circumference not to mean the typical mathematical definition, like here's a circle, the circumference is around. He said circumference could be anything. I could read the circumference this way. So as you pull it back, you're changing the circumference. It's not what I meant, but when I looked it up in the dictionary, because you can bring in dictionary definitions if you don't have one, dictionary actually did read on such a, such a reading of circumference, even though it's not the mathematical definition. Had I added the word mathematical definition, okay, would have been fine, but I didn't. So what did we do? Work with the examiner, and he said where the, I can't remember the exact language, but he called it the bulbous portion. He said the circumference of the bulbous portion decreases. I didn't have the word bulbous in either, but he said my drawings, they look bulbous, so we added the words bulbous in, and since it was in the drawings, it was allowed to add in without adding new matter, and we got the patent issued. Yay, happy story, happy client. Um, happy attorney, too. Very happy to get it through. Um, so that's the sort of, that's just a, a story of where drawings really can help you by having those things in there. In more business method type things, you tend to have flowcharts. So flowcharts also, since you have a flowchart of all the steps being carried out, it helps to explain it. It helps to make it easier to understand. I can't say it's as useful as a mechanical where you can actually say, hey, I, that's in there. I'm just going to add a description of what's in there. Because you can't add new matter in your patent once it's filed. It can't, it can't, it's got to be as of your filing date. There's something called the continuation in part. I'm not going to go there. It's very rare. but. Uh, if it's not in the, when you file, that's a problem. So that's why you want to get everything in there when you file and you want to have very good drawings. All right, any questions? Any comments? Anybody think of a patent attorney joke yet? All right, I was really reaching on that one. I didn't expect an answer. 
If you think of a patent attorney joke, feel free to blurt it out. All right, be expansive in your application. Now, this is just something I noticed, which I'm sure I'm not the only person to notice. If you look at patents that are old, if you look at Abraham Lincoln's patent, the only president to ever have a patent issued, uh, it was one or two pages. Okay, it's small font, there's two columns, whatever. It was very short. Today, there are 10, 20, 30 pages. I mean, when I draft them in uh, LibreOffice, which is the Linux equivalent of Microsoft Word, they come out about 30 pages, and then once they're printed, they're probably 7, 10, or whatever. But point being, they're a lot longer. I think part of that is because it's a lot easier to type them. It used to be you had the secretary with the correction tape. I actually started off working for an attorney doing his dictaphone because I could type. He hired me because I could type, and that's where I got my first job experience. Um, now, the interns who work for me, you know, it's a little bit more difficult because when the person you're working for types faster than you, it's like, I forget it, I'll just write that letter. I'm like, if you do it. But in any case, since it's so much easier, they tend to have gotten much longer. And not only have they gotten much longer, that since uh, you get rejections, which can be kind of, kind of not where you, not, uh, so to say, the best rejections in the world, what do we, so what do we do? We add in all sorts of definitions. We add in every variation, every alternative embodiment, everything we can think of in the kitchen sink in order that we, can, we don't miss anything. Because if you're expansive and you don't claim it, it's, it's OK. You might hurt yourself for a later patent if you disclose something that really should be in the next patent. But if you're expansive and you give different variations, then you have room to work with to modify your claims later. So sometimes I'll use comprising of and consisting of. Why? Because comprising in the definitions of patents, for those of you unfamiliar, means any comprising means what I disclose here and anything more. Consisting of means what I disclose here and nothing more. Consisting of you see often in like chemical patents. Because in chemical patents, um, it's it, it's tends, it, it tends to lend itself towards getting around the prior art by saying that the uh, uh, boron source is between 90 and 92%. So I'll say consisting of a boron source, an activator, and I forget the third thing in that patent that I did. But in any case, uh, that would mean only those things and nothing else, because maybe there's something else other people put in, but that does something very different. So in business method patents, we tend to use comprising because we want it to be expansive. And in chemical, it's more likely to use consisting, but not always. Wherever we can use comprising, we generally want to because it's much broader. Use may. It may have this. It may not. That's in our disclosure, not our claims. Claims, remember, have to be precise. A claim is like Yoda, do or do not. It has no try. Whereas in the specification, well, you wouldn't say try either. You would say it may have. It may have this. It may have that, another embodiment, because maybe you need to bring those in later. And some of your claims might be for a first thing. Some of your claims might be for a second thing. So um, and don't talk badly about the technology, about technology or the prior art. It just makes you look bad as far as I'm concerned. And one case I took over from somebody else, examiner actually asked me to take it out. And I said, no problem. We'll just delete that from the specification. All right, claim drafting with office action in mind. Um, so just to give some more stuff, if you have support variations, you'd be better prepared. Make your claims count. Um, when you draft your claims, use them. You get 20 claims for the same price. So you should make each one have something that's a novel variation. If you add something simple and silly, it's probably th this thing makes a sound. It's probably going nowhere. So you want to make it uh, have all different variations. Make the examiner's hard job harder. Make the examiner's job harder and make your job of getting the patent easier. Uh, draft claims limited to what is new and unobvious of the prior art, but be as broad as possible. Don't sell yourself short. But if you go overly broad, you're going to get a rejection. Now, some attorneys will start overly broad, get the rejection, then work with the examiner to try and get what they really want in the fir first place. That's a school of thought. Another school of thought is just make your claims good and fight, fight, fight. Uh, there's reasons to do that, again, for litigation, because if you narrow your claims, there's something called festo issues, where you now lose the equivalence. You lose the similar things. So it's um, litigators frown on when narrow, you narrow claims or when there's long prosecution history. Is that right? Not always. Not always. OK, not always. Some litigators sometimes frown on it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, uh, if you have, a, you have claims that just went right through the patent office, then there's less to harp on. There's less to find problems with later in litigation. Uh, as when you're doing patent prosecution, you're usually just happy to get the patent issued and say, great, I got a good set of claims regardless. All right, so that is the end of the section on drafting the patent application. Are there any questions, anything 
um, at all. Anyone who's watching this on the webcast want to send in questions? I heard a yes. OK. Um, <laughs> now we're going to go on to the non-prior art rejections. OK. You there watching the webcast, it's not nice to talk that way about me. Thanks. OK. Bad joke. All right, I'll be funnier. Um, <laughs> when you receive an office action, so now we're going to get to the meat and potatoes. Uh, so when you receive an office action, then what, what, do you, what do we do here? So now we're going to break this down into its component parts. We're going to now figure out how do you look at this thing. Because when you look at the whole big picture, you look at this thing, sometimes they're like this. You get, they cite all these references and they cite all these things, 50 pages with another 100 pages of things that they've cited uh, in literature. And they, if they're not citing a patent, they give you a copy of the literature. So first thing I determine is what, how am I going to communicate with the client? Because it depends on the client. Some of my clients I've done five patents for, and I work with them all the time. I talk to them every day. I was just emailing them this morning, come to think of it. And you know, they're like, OK, just take care of it. We trust you. So I'll say, here's the office action. I'm going to take care of it. Send you an invoice at the end of the month. Others, you know, they're really going to want to know. If it's guy's first time, they tend to be nervous. They look at this first patent. They look at this first rejection. And sometimes I get, re get letters which are just like, you know, if someone says, how could you do this? How could you get a rejection like this? I thought you knew what you were doing. And you can explain to them over and over. They reject everything. But my idea is so great. Yes, but they reject everything. But this is so wonderful and he'd understand it. Yes, I understand that. We now have to go through the process. We now have to talk to the examiner. We now, and so sometimes I will give them comments and I'll just sort of look through it and give it to them. Personally, I want to get paid before I do anything too sub sub substantive. So what do I do? I'll give them a quick paragraph and I'll tell them, and I break it up into two parts. First part is review of the office action, which I'm going to go into how I do that, and examiner interview. And the second part is the, is the written write-up, depending on what we're able to accomplish in the review, how good the rejection is, and so forth. So I'll send the client uh, the cited art, uh, see if they want to comment on it, and just keep in mind you want to respond the best way possible. So for example, my boronization client She's like the worldwide expert in boronization of titanium. I don't know how many people boronize titanium. It's a very difficult thing to do. Suffice to say, she has at least one patent on it that filed through me. So when I get the rejection on that one, I sort of call her up and talk to her and say, OK, what's this rejection? Explain it to me and so forth, because she's going to be able to explain better. If I get the pacifier weeding device, simple enough. Or if I get something, um, telephone routing or something like that, where I am more competent in than boronization of titanium, uh, or business methods, whatever it is, then, that, then, then on those, I'll sort of provide the comments first. And I'll say, OK, this is closest, this is and this, and so forth. Now let's go from here and start doing the review. All right, first, before we get into that, a note about deadlines. Once you get the office action, uh, you, this is where lawyers can get into trouble is missing deadlines. It's like one of the biggest things to get sued for is missing deadlines in client communication. If you have good client communication, you don't usually get sued, uh, even if you do a bad job. And if you miss a deadline, that is by definition a bad job. So you do not want to miss, def you do not want to miss deadlines. So typically what I do is when I get an office action, you have three months. You can see there on the slide, three months is the regular deadline to respond to an office action. So typically what I want to do is I'll send the client the summary and the invoice right away, or depending on how I work with the client, you know, whatever it is, the, either a tell them I'll bill them or the, the invoice. And I'll tell them to, that to resp you know, pay the invoice within 30 days. And my invoice system is pretty cool because it sends an automatic reminder if they don't pay it when it's due. And so that gives them a reminder. Now, if I haven't begun work by two months, I'm running into probably a little tight because, like most attorneys, you get busy and you have a lot of work. And you need time in order to portion things. And as the flow of business goes, sometimes you have a lot, sometimes you have less. So you kind of want to flow it a little more even. Um, so in any case, we'll dock it out these days. One month, two months, three months is the regular deadline. After that, then you start paying government fees for it taking longer. So you can go to six months as long as you pay a government fee, which right now for a small entity less than 500 employees is $75 for between the third and fourth month. Uh, I want to say 265 or 285, I think it is now, between the fourth and fifth month, and I think 585 up to the sixth month. If you don't respond by the sixth month, the patent is abandoned. There are ways to revive a patent. Um, I just did one recently. 
uh, they will generally revive, there's an unwritten rule that they will revive an unintentionally abandoned patent up to two years. It's expensive. Basically, you pay the government a lot of money. It helps the budget for the patent office. It helps them siphon off money to fight two wars at the same time. And uh, then they will revive your patent application. So we don't even hear about those wars. I actually have clients who are soldiers in Afghanistan. And the stuff they tell me, it's like, really? Like, we don't even hear about it on the news. But um, anyway, I'm not sure how much of a digression to Afghanistan I'll get to. But uh, whatever. <laughs> it's pretty bad over there. OK, office action summary. All right, so the office action summary on the first page, it gives you a road map. So the reason I'm taking this step by step is basically if you look at one of these big office actions and you look at these 50 pages of rejections, you're going to get nowhere. Um, there is a there is, uh, is famous, I get a little religious here, ra rabbi called Rav Moshe Chaim Lozato, 1700s, that he was a, he, he wanted to write in Kabbalah. They didn't let him do that because of various political stuff going on at the time. He died at 39 years old. But one of the books that he wrote is a whole conversation between the, the heart and the mind. And the, basically, the heart sees the big picture. The heart sees the whole thing and has the, the emotions and the feeling about it. Uh, the mind will break things down into, into little pieces and these things more logically. And that's really the goal here is when reviewing these office actions to break it down into the component parts. If you can break it down into each component part and examine each component part, then you can put it back together and then your emotion goes from how do I deal with this, this is too overwhelming, to, and this is probably a good deal for good uh, advice for life in general, uh, to, okay, now that I've dealt with all the parts, now I can see the whole thing and now I can enjoy it and appreciate the big picture. So when you get the office action summary, then you get this road map, which sort of gives you a little bit of an idea, assuming it's, it's accurate. And it might have allowed claims. It might have objected to claims. Those are claims that objected to are minor issues you can usually fix with wording. And you can take those claims, and you can file a divisional for the rest so you don't have a chance of losing them. Uh, if an office action marks, is marked final, I tend to downplay that a little because clients go nuts if they say, final rejection. You know, Final rejection is nothing you can do. Final rejection is really code word for the patent office wants more money. You can either at that point do two things. The second rejection is usually marked final. At that point, you pay them more money and request continued examination. Or you can uh, file a notice of pre-appeal, or sometimes even the threat of that will get the examiner to move. But usually I found not, so I use that sparingly unless it's a really bad rejection. Uh, but pre-appeal is a way of getting a panel of four, four people to look at it uh, in order to assess whether it's correct or not. All right. Um, that slide ended up in here. Uh, maybe this is a different slide. Okay, so you may want to take the allowed claims and file a divisional for the rest, and it should state the type of uh, type of rejections. It might be serious ones if it's rejection compared to the prior art. Objections are less serious and serious and allowable matter is what you want. Okay, final rejection. So this is a new slide for this year for those of you who heard last year. So final rejection. Here are your options if you get twice rejected. So you can, as I was saying just before, you can file a continuation and try again. So basically, right now it's an extra $465 government fee. If your client is less than 500 employees, it's double that if they're more than 500 or more. Uh, you can negotiate allowable claims. Sometimes examiners will say, I have more time to do searching. This is something relatively recent. Is they're giving them, it seems to be only in some, um, some, uh, I can't remember the name, some offices within the patent office, they're giving them more time. Others seem to be saying, no, they don't. Uh, but some will have more time and say, OK, fine, give me an amendment to the claim. I'll have more time. I'll have another hour or two. I'll talk to you. I'll search it. And maybe you can get it allowed. I've had that happen. Um, that one happened where I had a bottle cap that was irreversible. Uh, you select the addition. It was irreversibly removable. and. It was just a matter of bringing in the definition and showing exactly where the definition was. And I said, this is different than what the prior art that was just cited is. And the examiner said, OK, I'll allow that. And we got the patent, which you can, again, see on my website. Uh, Pre-appeal, then appeal. Pre-appeal is relatively inexpensive. It's $315, yeah, $315 right now, government fee for a pre-appeal. You have five pages to make your argument. It's reviewed by four people. If you respond to a final rejection with two months, you get an advisory action where, where the uh, examiner will actually tell you, give you another roadmap of what they'll do, will they allow in these new claims, <coughs> or so forth. 
All right. Um, here is what the actual page looks like. You'll see there is a mail date on the uh, cover sheet that they give you. Note that mail mailing date because that is where you calculate your deadlines from. Three months out is when your responses due with re regular timelines. So in that three months, you want to do your review. I try and do that. <coughs> yeah, the client pays it within one month. I do my review between months one and two and schedule an examiner interview. They're not always available, so you know you have to leave some time to schedule it. Or if they are, you know, it still might take a couple days till you're available, they're available. They're usually pretty flexible about it. You can actually go down to Alexandria, Virginia, and you can actually have in-person interviews, which is a good idea because, although it is expensive to you know, pay your attorney to travel down to Alexandria and so forth, the likelihood of success is highest when you have an in-person interview, is second highest when you have a telephone interview, and is least highest when you have no interview. So I think it makes sense when you talk to them and explain what it is. So, and then there's the cover sheet on the right hand side, uh, the summary sheet on the right hand side telling you what claims have been examined, what's allowed, and so forth. Okay, whoops. Okay, now we're going to get to restriction requirements. So, restriction requirements are, in my mind, and I think most patent attorneys' minds on this side of the dial, um, ridiculously overused. Re uh, restriction requirement is basically they're saying you have 20 claims in your application, we're only going to examine six of them. Why? Because those six are related to a method of using it, and your next ones are related to a device that carries out that method, and your next one is a system for doing it. I got, in the last two days, three phone calls from examiners that wanted to do restriction requirements. I was able to talk one of the three out of it, which is really good. Believe it or not, <laughs> talking one out of a restriction requirement on the phone is amazing. I, like, I posted this on the patent practitioner's list. I talked about it. You know, everyone's like, well, so let's pat you on the back. So, but in writing, I have successfully been able to talk them out of it. Generally speaking, just to tell you, like, what they will do is they'll say, the search for these claims are in this class. The search for this one is in this class. So the, the, the way they divide out patents is like class 705 is business method. Class 379 is telephonic communications. So your, your, your product might fall in both of them. So they'll say, well, here I have to search here, and here I have to search there. And it's usually... Like, okay, examiner, 90% of the patents that you're going to find that are relevant to this are in both because it's a business method using telephones, you know, or whatever it is. So, you can say there's such an overlap of the search and so forth. Um, and not, not only that, I'm going to get into this, but it has to be a serious search burden. If you see here, I've got on the screen MPEP, the Manual of Patent uh, Examination Procedure, is uh, in Section 803. There are two criteria for proper, pro I'll just not read that, proper restrictions. They have to be independent and distinct. Inventions have to be independent and distinct. This is a little hard one to, uh, harder one to argue than B, which is serious search burden. You can't just say it's a burden. They're all burdens. It's your job. You have a job to do. You're answering, you're evaluating patents. It's a burden. Anything you do is, you know, you want pleasure, you've got to go through a burden. Otherwise, you're just going to have comfort. You need to have that burden. So. You know, sorry, government worker, to burden you, but please examine my patent. You know, it's kind of like what you're arguing here. So it has to be a serious search burden. So uh, they'll often not apply this test. They'll just say, oh, this is in one class, this is in the other one. And I'll say, and? Well, it's in two classes, so it's two different inventions. Okay, part B. Is it a, that was two, not B. Is it a serious search burden? So we make these arguments. So we make these arguments that it's not a serious search burden because you have to search both of them. Or I'll make the arguments that I've had most success with, and this is the one I talked the examiner out of two days ago, was the claims are the same. You're going to say, she said, well, your claim, I forget which was which, one discloses an electrical uh, device, an electrical way of powering it, and your other one discloses any power source. And? <laughs> You know, you're going to tell me, because I didn't specify in one electrical, and the other one I said any power source is a serious search burden. You know, uh, electricity is kind of behind most patents that are being filed today, you know? It's kind of a prerequisite for a lot of them. It's not really something that makes a serious search burden because I specified the type of a uh, power source coming in. Um, and that sort of thing. And then she would point out, well, this has this feature and this has not. So claim one in the first set did have that feature. But I happened to have that over in claim 17, not in the independent, but dependent, because I shuffled the order a little bit. So, and then I had another one that was like also same client, same sort of deal. 
That one I wasn't able to talk to the, the examiner out of, so we're just going to have to put the response on paper, which unfortunately or fortunately cost the client more money because now instead of a half hour phone call with the examiner or 20 minutes, whatever it was, now I'm going to have to write this whole formal response. So anyway, and sometimes they budge, sometimes they don't budge. I'm going to go through the cases where they budge and don't budge. First, you can see what happens. For example, in biotech, it's jumped from 1,000 restrictions out of 32,000 office actions in 1993 to 2008. There is not that many more office actions, it's 42,000, but you can see the number of restrictions jumped way up. But never fear, because overcoming these restrictions are, is done 54% of the time. That's about half. That's as good as it gets to overcome these requirements. In others, computers, 6%. It's very difficult to overcome if they go and say, what tends to happen in business method patents, which is computer, is no real thing is computer patents, a method of carrying A, B, and C, is we claim a device which uh, receives a call uh, from a caller, forwards it to an 800 number, forwards it back to the person, now populating with the caller ID, they'll say that's one patent, whereas the method of doing the exact same thing, they'll say is another. And it's very hard to overcome those rejections. In that case, I actually didn't get a rejection. And that's actually one of my clients, trapcall.com, which is really cool. Uh, free plug for my client, because he's, he's a good client. Um, where, where if you get a phone call on your phone and its caller ID is blocked, you just hit the voicemail button and it goes over to voicemail. But really what it's doing is it's still ringing for the caller. It's temporarily, instead of phoning it to at and Verizon voicemail, it's forwarding it to his system. And it forwards it very quickly to an 800 number, forwards it back to his system, and then back to your phone. You get it a second time, and now your caller ID is unblocked. Pretty cool. That's the kind of stuff that you can patent. Uh, and it shows you the actual caller ID on it. And he's actually got not one, but two patents on that that we filed about two years apart for two different aspects of it, both of them issued on the same day. The chance of that happening is ridiculous, that you file two patents for the same device two years apart with different aspects of it, and the same day they issue. And the crazy part is the one that I filed first, you get 20 years from data filing because of the delay it took on that, that one. That one expires later than the later filed one because due to patent office delay on it. So that's interesting patent attorney trivia that you know, only I think patent attorneys will be like, wow. So anyway. <laughs> uh, OK, Ex exam so this is an example of what is going, I just sort of went through this already. But this is an example. Claims 1 through 10 are a method of making some sort of complex article of manufacture. Claims 11 through 20 are the device for making the same thing. These are a little hard unless you have a lot of overlap between the claims, unless you really have the same features. One thing I've started doing sometimes in some of my patents is I'm, I, I'll do a device claim, for example, method, it claims 1 through 10 will be device claims. Claim 11 will be a method of carrying out the device of claim 1, including steps of A, B, and C. Then claim 12 will be a method claim that stands on its own. Because then what happens? They say, well, I want to restrict the device from the method. And I'll, I'll say, well, the method is really intertwined. I do it a little bit more subtly than what I just said. You know, it's really intertwined because you have steps there. So you can really say it's intertwined between the two. So what I call the intertwinement argument, which depending on how you draft your application, you can make the intertwinement more whole and much more um, stronger. Much more strong. You can make it stronger. All right. Uh, now, sometimes they give you this type of thing. I've been seeing this a little less, but this is boilerplate language that they'll give you. That they'll, if they use the word and, that's a good start. If they say it's independent and it's a serious search burden, that's a good start. Uh, and they'll, they'll give you this boilerplate, one or more reasons will apply. Different classification, different class subclass. The prior art applicable will not be likely applicable to another invention. D is sort of one that I never really see them spell out other than the boilerplate. It's another place you can use because it tends to be my argument to overcome it. The prior art is going to be the exact same. You search one, you search the other. Um, all right. So this is an example where I overcame one. This was for a ball selector. This was a method of playing a game of chance, class 270, 273, subclass 269, ball selector, also in class 273. Uh, balls for the ball selector. And the ball selector itself was a different class 463. So you can see you've got different things here. You've got a method, you have the balls, and you have the ball selector itself. And the office action says, this would be a burden of search on the part of the examiner. Very good. Clearly not the legal test. Serious search burden and independent and distinct. So 
I looked at the examiner search report. These aren't very well looked at, but you can see here what he's, uh, what he's searched. So you, you can see the classes and subclasses, exactly how he's done his search, what keywords. You find keywords in there that apply to both, that apply to keywords that are actually in the set of claims he didn't examine, there's a good argument. What subclass class and subclass did he search? I've seen cases where they'll restrict it, say that you have class 100 and 500, they restrict it to the one in class 500. Their search starts off with a search of everything in class 100. You know, so it's already been searched. How do you say it's a serious search burden? I didn't win on that argument. They maintained the restriction and we didn't petition it, but we should have. Uh, it depends on what the client's willing to do. Uh, sometimes you also just don't want to argue too much because you're happy to get one set of claims allowed and for less money than it's going to cost them to fight them, you can just file the divisional and get the second application. Examiners like divisional applications because for very similar work, they get double the amount of time to do it. And since they have double the amount of time to do it, they're happier. So sometimes you can just make the examiner happy, they'll make you happy and the love goes around. All right, so. Uh, you must provisionally elect one grouping. You have to say which one you're electing. And you must say, if you want to make arguments, you have to say it's with traverse. And I've gone over these sort of arguments intertwinement, and the search covers both anyway. And I'm going to jump now to rejections under 35 USC 101. So 35 USC 101, I'm going to pause here. Anybody? Any questions? Okay. Rejection under 35 U.S.C. 101 is it limits uh, patentability to any new useful process machine manufacturer composition matter, any new useful improvement thereof. In practice, most 101 rejections, if it's probably written application, are business method patents for software. So Bilski is a Supreme Court case that happened about two years ago, where it's longer than that, three years ago, four, I don't know how long it's been now. Bilski is the current test we use that in order for something to not be abstract, it has to be transformation of matter or tied to a specific machine. Now, as ridiculous as this is, I'm going to summarize the current state of patent prosecution for abstract in a few words. The answer that you want right now is non-transitory storage medium. You put in your claim that it is a non-transitory storage medium, which is doing steps A, B, C, and D, that not always, but tends to be the language that they were looking for, and that's what we put in the specification to say that, make sure we have support for it, but even so, they'll allow you to add it. A year ago, we'd use the word processor. Two years ago, we would just say plain old storage medium. It changes with the court cases, it changes with politics, it changes with who knows what. Because trying to define what you can't define is a very difficult thing to do. So you keep getting the Supreme Court cases changing the test, and then we get to this point where you get too many patents coming through for too many crazy things, and they say, and the patent office is way too overburdened, so what do they do? They change the test, they make it more restrictive, they use new language, and then here's the problem. When they did that, when Bilski came out, it was just when the economy crashed and the patent office couldn't meet its budget and they weren't getting nearly enough patents filed to begin with and they weren't allowing any of these and suddenly they got more expansive again and said, oh, just use this language and it fits with Bilski. They didn't say it as bluntly as that, but that is more or less how it comes down to. Examiners sort of just apply bright line rules. They're, they're very rarely, if ever, have I seen one go on to crazy analysis of Bilski and really is this a uh, transformation of matter or not, is this a specific machine or not. They just say uh, this language does, is, is no good under Bilski and then sometimes even suggest it, use this language, it'll be okay. And that's the bright line rule for applying. And that's the way it is. All right, so here are the examples of the words computer readable storage medium, then it went to processor, and now it went to non-transitory storage medium. And otherwise, the, you, if there's a office action suggestion, just follow it. You can't patent a law of nature. You can't do patent ball lightning. But you can patent a method of creating it or capturing it on film. And if you can do that, that's pretty cool. Um, I've seen YouTube videos where they actually show videos of ball lightning. But I'm not sure they're real or not. They claim to be. All right, now we get to prior art rejections. Who knows what ball lightning is? Oh, man. <laughs> ball lightning is a phenomenon where the lightning actually see it seems like lightning and actually is a ball of electricity that's that's lit up that seems to be like rolling across the floor that there's many documented cases of um, of it I haven't read read up on this in a couple of years they might be actually like able to produce it more readily but anyway um, it's uh, I don't know it's fun stuff 
Okay, prior art rejections. So first review of the Austin's action. So as I was saying before, we're going to break down that emotional, wow, look at this big thing and what am I going to do with it? And we're going to just break it down into pieces. Start with piece one. So manageable pieces. First, I recommend don't read the office action. Don't read his rejection. The rejection, you're just going to start thinking like him. You don't want to think like him. You don't want to see the, the you don't want to see it from a negative point of view. Um, my uh, attorney, that I, the first attorney I ever worked for, he said after a, someone, an examiner works at the patent office for like five years, forget it. No one wants them in private practice because they can't see the invention. All they see is negativity. All they say, that's not patentable, that's not patentable, that's not patentable. You don't want to see it that way. You want to see it positive first and see what the arguments are for your side. So know who, know, what's that Shakespearean phrase? Know yourself before you, whatever. Before you can go out and conquer the world, I'll make up my own. Before you go out and conquer the world, you've got to be stable inside. You've got to be stable inside and know what you stand for. How's that? Okay. So focus on prior art cited. First, you probably want to review your patent application with the claims and see what you're talking about because you might have written it one, two, three, or five years ago. And see what you're talking about and get in your head what you're trying to accomplish. What are you trying to claim here? Then look at the prior art references. Look at what's cited. Get an understanding of them. So I do a high-level analysis, and then what I'm calling this year, and this year's talk, the LOTA method, because it flows better with the vowel in the middle, the L-O-T-A method of analysis. So uh, this is where we start. When you review the prior art references, we want to know what they're talking about. So you check the earliest filing date of each cited reference. So first of all, make sure it's a valid reference. Until Saturday, uh, the, you can, for patent applications filed before Saturday, uh, which many, if you've already filed them, they'll be in the queue. Uh, you can swear behind the reference. You can actually say, although I filed this January 1st, 2011, I invented it January 1st, 2010 at a really killer New Year's party. And here is my evidence of it written on the back of the whiskey bottle showing that I invented it that morning, which having just watched the Mythbusters Hangover episode, that's not likely, but anyway. Um, in any case, that was, a, that was a really good episode. The beer before liquor thing, uh, it turns out, in terms of hangover, it's not true. You get a much worse hangover from straight beer than you do with beer mixed with liquor. They tested it. Um, any case, interesting, fun factoids you get from listening to me talk. Um, so, I mentioned it's one of two TV shows I watched, the other being Shark Tank. Where was I? Uh, we were talking about alcohol. Oh, inventing it one year prior. So you can swear behind, you can show evidence to show you invented it one year prior. This is why there is a huge rush to filing and patent attorneys are taking bets on what time during the day the uh, patent office's electric filing si electronic filing system crashes tomorrow because everyone's, Friday's the last work day, everyone's going to get in those patents before the law changes and you can no longer swear behind and now it's based on first filing date. We're moving to a first filing date system where it matters who filed it first. But for your older patents, you can say, hey, this reference is, is you know, those before my filing date is after my invention date, I still deserve the patent. So you can look at the search report, see where he searched, did they find a lot, they spent a lot of time, it gives you some clues. You know, if they spent two hours searching, it might mean they did a thorough job, it might mean they had trouble finding things. If they did five minutes of searching, it might be they found something right away, or it might be they did a poor job. So really it doesn't tell you anything without more intrinsic evidence, but because it could be either way, but it might give you some idea of what's going on in his mind. And the reality is, many first office actions people don't respond to. They go abandoned anyway. And the reality is, they tend not to understand it because they haven't read it fully, if it's especially if it's something complex. So you're going to see office actions that just you can poke holes in. Uh, not always, but a lot of the time. Sometimes you have to amend your claims, sometimes you're done because they found some reference dead on, but if you did the search properly, that won't happen or should, is unlikely, I should say this, is very unlikely to happen because you'll have known what the close references are and counseled the client appropriately before they filed it. Sometimes I get clients that say, this is true story. I gave them a rejection. I cited it in two places, exactly where it was shown in the prior art. She sent me back a letter with a check saying, um, I understand you don't think it'll get through, but I want to see the rejection from the patent office. It literally said those words. I want to see the, something like that. The patent office will reject it. Filed it, I got the rejection. <laughs> you know, I tried to do something to try and make it through, make it different, because you can't file something that you, you really think isn't patentable. So I tried something that is probably considered obvious, and sure enough, it was, and that was the state of things. 
But you, after the first office action is really when you're teaching it to the examiner many times. You really you have that phone conference. You explain to them what you're doing. Sometimes I just didn't understand it. They read it differently. They looked at it differently. You just explained it. It's like, oh, yeah, that discloses X. It doesn't disclose Q. Most applications get at least one rejection, whether you're supposed to or not. So we're going to start with our high-level analysis. What's the point? What are you doing here? What's the problem to be solved? I'll go on my pacifier example. Point is pacifier weaning. Smaller nub helps you wean, wean your kid off the pacifier. As I said, with my three-year-old, not likely. But I don't know, maybe we should try it. I really should get a free sample from him and try it. But we're afraid she would know the difference right away. Not my passy. Not my passy. Anyway, she really does sound like that. OK, so review it. Refresh your recollection. Don't get sidetracked by anything, out, put anything else. Put it in your own head. Or even better, you're going to use this in the response to office action anyway. Write a paragraph. Write a paragraph focused on re referring to things in your application of what it's about and what it's doing. Cite back to a paragraph number so you can make it look serious, make it be serious, because then you should look it up and see that it's there. Make the examiner's job easy. Uh, review the cited prior art. What's its point? So again, write a paragraph each one. What's each one doing? Because you write it down, you use more than just reading it and seeing it. Uh, you might even, it's a good idea, time-wise it's usually not so feasible. Talk it out with somebody else. If you have two people on it, you talk it out and explain it, understand it. You know, get it in your own head and write a paragraph about it so you use all your senses to get involved in uh, sort of immersing yourself in understanding what it is. Then and only then, once you have it clear in your head what yours is, what theirs is, what's the difference? What's different about yours and what's different about theirs? That's what you're going to be looking for. And those differences <coughs> are what you should look for in your claims. Find your claims, find those differences. You don't see the differences there, and you can't convince yourself from looking at the prior art there's anything new there. Well, then find the differences and put them in the claims and think of claim amendments. Only then, after you've done that, should you then go and look at the office action. Because if you don't know what it says, you're just going to get sidetracked by looking at that. And he's going to say, or she is going to say in the examiner, this discloses all of these features here, 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 and here. And they're going to cite all these different things. And you might just get caught up in their arguments and not know where to start looking for what's incorrect. If you have it in your head clearly first, then it makes your job a lot easier. So, so here is an example. This is now US patent 8128089. Not the one that I had Mark Cuban draw for. He drew for an ARFID lottery device for me. We, he actually protected um, using ARFID devices to uh, bet on lottery games. But this is for the same client. Um, that this was for the, the ball thing that I had spoken about with the restriction requirements, where I overcame the restriction. Um, this is a, a spherical ball with internal transponder freely, freely movable. <laughs> OK, so this is, imagine this is your ping pong ball that you're using in a lottery game. And inside it, can I open this? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Oh, it twists. OK, you can get a design patent on this. So inside, this thing is not freely movable. Inside his chapstick, this is a really good prop, thanks. Inside this chapstick, this thing is solid and doesn't move. So that was the prior art. In the prior art, they had a transponder in here for RFID. RFID is like what you use in your easy pass that it reads your, um, as you go by, it sends electrical signal and it reads the response. Uh, so his was freely movable rolling around. So this prevents the ball from getting lost by rolling around as the transponder is constantly working against the centrifugal motion of the ball. So further, as recited, this is important implications for efficient reading of data transponder. Why? Because if you're in a lottery machine and you got this ball rolling through, hope you can see this on camera, then what happens is the transponder is right here and it reads it. So you want the thing falling to the bottom so it always gets a read. If it's in the middle, surrounded by packaging and all this other stuff, then it's at least less likely to be read properly. Doesn't necessarily make it bad, but it's at least less likely. So we made that argument. And now here's the prior art cited. This was a patent application. I don't think this thing ever issued into a patent. You can tell that it's an application, not a patent, because the number on it is US 2006 slash. 2006 is the year. If it's a patent, it has a seven-digit number. And it's towards balls that are made of translucent resid resin with an RFID tag. So the reason why I use this example is it's very visual, rather than giving you something on forwarding and unblocking caller ID. Um, so here it said figure three, which is what he referred to, says it shows a tag fixed on a plane passing through the center of ball two. It really doesn't disclose this the thing. It, that was just a picture. It didn't say whether it was movable or not or stuck in place. But point being, the, the patent office has to show it movable. They didn't show it movable. So since they didn't, then my argument was, hey, 
We don't know if that's, that, that's really freely movable. In fact, it's probably not. Why? A resin ball. If you make a ball out of resin, you're probably going to make a solid resin ball. You're not going to make a hollow resin ball. Uh, so, give this back to you. Ha, oh, he caught it. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we've reviewed our claims. We've looked at the prior art cells. We've picked out the differences in the claim features. Now we know where we stand. We know who we are. We know who our client is. We hopefully remember our home address, our wife's anniversary, whatever it is. So now, once you know all that, you're ready to look at the office action. Okay, so in the office action, this is the way I break it down into its component parts. Again, we want to put the emotions aside for a sec, and we're going to be strictly analytical. Analyzing patents is analytical. Analyzing patents, anal yes, analyzing patents is analytical. Okay, for yeah, okay. I won't harp more on uh, the analytic route. Okay, so I call this the LOTA method of systematic responses. So LOTA is limitation. Copy and paste each limitation. What is each limitation? What is, in each of your claims, you claim a ball with a RFID responder in the middle, freely movable. Each of those things is a different limitation. Freely movable, RFID, ball, everything. In the office action, copy and paste the rejection for each limitation. What did they cite? So I break it down. I actually will take the text of the document, use PDF Reader, put a square around it, and copy it and paste it into my own analysis. And I often share this with the, the client as well so they can see. Each page, I have a separate limitation. Claim one, first limitation, ball. Office action, paragraph three, whatever. Uh, and I'll paste the actual limitation there. Co text is copy the actual text. See what they're saying, text, and see what their ar the argument. Does the text match the limitation? So if their argument, then now that I've reviewed this whole thing, I have it clear in my head, and what is their actual argument? So now I've broken down line by line. Do they cite a ball? Do they show that there's a ball in the prior art? And in this case, yes, they did. And you, this is a reiterative process that you repeat for each and every limitation. I actually start a new page for each limitation, and sometimes you hand the client 50 to 70 page document, and it looks substantial, because it is. You've done a full and proper analysis. It's not the only way to do it. Uh, you don't have to do it this way, but um, it, doing this for however long I've been doing this, I uh, started in 2004, uh, eight years now, uh, since I got my first job in patents, I still do it this way. Um, this is kind of a self-made method based on you know, basically what attorneys do. I just sort of formalize this method into making it very systematic, very analytical. So this way, you don't look at the thing and go, what do I do with this? You break it down into each part. And now, for example, uh, we're going to go into with the office action is improper unless each and every limitation is cited in the prior art. So you make sure each and every limitation, there is a citation. Sometimes they just kind of tell you, Li uh, claim one cited here in this patent. It's really improper. They're supposed to cite with specificity where it's claimed in each. The, it give you actual line numbers or at least sections, a number like 10 line area or whatever it is. So you can argue it's improper. Sometimes that works, sometimes not. Um, if you can figure out what they're saying, try and figure it out because it's just most advantageous time-wise. And if it's 103, they have to give a reason for obviousness. That's where they combine multiple references. And they'll say it's obvious, and we'll say they have to give a reason. Truth be told, it's very hard to argue over an obviousness type rejection. Because what they'll do is they'll smash two references together, and they can smash anything together in US patent practice. Europe's a little bit different. Uh, but uh, in order to say, that's not obvious to combine it, it's like winning an argument with your brother. You know, you argue with your brother, and you say, uh, that's, that's, not, you know, that, that's not your ball. And he says, yes, it is my ball. No, it's not. Yes, it is. That's kind of like this argument. It's not obvious. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. So the best way to do these arguments is to show that feature is missing alone or in combination. Even though to you it's not obvious and to the average person it's not obvious, if they say it's obvious, better to amend your claims to find a way to make something different than the combination of those two things. All right, so iteration one. Here's the first limitation. A generally spherical encasement with a hollow interior. So that's the L of the LOTA method. O, office action. Each ball comprises a spherical encasement with a hollow interior, see figure three. Text. Well, the text in this case, why I'm using this example is it's a picture. 
is that's not hollow. I don't know that that's hollow if that's the only disclosure. And in this reference, it was the only disclosure. So it really never said hollow anywhere. I can't tell from that picture. So my argument, it's not hollow. So limitation, spherical encasement with hollow interior. Okay, I didn't break up spherical encasement because I didn't think that was new. You see that in all ping pong balls. But the office action, there's a hollow interior. Okay, you say there's a hollow interior? Actually look at it. Look at what it says in the patent application. That's not a hollow interior. If it is, I can't tell. So argument, no, it's not enough to show hollow. Next limitation, a near field communication reader below an exit tube. So why? Because I had in here, now your ball is ro rolling along. I gave him back his chapstick. But down here, you've got the reader right here as it rolls along. So it has to be below the exit tube. So this is a tube where the ball exits out. We want to read it just before it exits or after it exits and sits in the tube. So the office action said, the ball selector also comprises this near field communication reader. Because yeah, I just copied and pasted from the office action, exactly what I do in my analysis. Uh, antenna 48, which is below an exit tube, ball recovery box 32. OK, now we're going to go look at this. Does this, is this rejection make sense? Well, if I've looked at it before, I've looked at the reference, I'm hopefully going to know. But you're not going to know, you know, unless you're, uh, what's his name, Rain Man, you're not going to memorize exactly where each part of each thing is. So I need to find where is antenna 48 and go look at it to see if that's true. So the problem is there is no recitation of, of antenna 48 in paragraph 67. Why? Because, well, I'm, why? Because the examiner didn't cite it properly. So now I'm going to go and find this. Because even though he didn't cite it properly, if you just say you didn't cite it properly, he's just going to come back with a final rejection and say, here it is. Thanks. So now you've got a problem. So a much better argument is to go find the stupid thing. So the antenna 48 is disposed between the rotating disks. The antenna 48 has rectangular coils. So there is an antenna 48. It was one paragraph off. You know, so we just cite the thing. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you can look at the picture, but in any case, it wasn't in the right place. It describes figure 8, so what do I do? I say that in the antenna, the reader, or he's calling it an antenna, fine, reader antenna, I'll give it that. An antenna is, in fact, an RFID reader, because it, well, it's part of the reader. It's part of what reads it is the antenna, below an exit tube. We could have maybe argued that. But uh, w then we go and find, we find it, and we see an antenna is actually a coil around the ball, not the exit tube. So you can see there, if you look at it, Oh, that's my problem. It's 48. It's number 48, which is the coil around the ball. That's not below the exit tube. That's not really an exit tube. We see there's a ground there. You can see the hatching marks for the ground. But it's all around it that it's reading it. Because it's probably, if the thing is in the middle, you're going to have to read it all You know, you want a reader all around. So ours is new and better and wonderful and not obvious because we don't need a reader all around. We have the reader down here. That's it. So the prior art, this is my argument. After we do that, limitation off of extra text, the argument, the A in Loda, is the prior art citation does not show a reader below the exit tube because the reader is actually around the ball path and above the exit tube. Does not show a reader below the exit tube because the reader is actually around the ball path and above the exit tube. So that's not at the exit tube at all. So I made that argument too. So we do that for each and every limitation. And only if you have a proper way to argue. There's no point in arguing something where there really is no argument. It's not going to get you anywhere. Because people don't like to read documents that long. Sometimes these come out long. But it's best to focus or at least put forward your best arguments first. So for, thi for this purpose, you, you want to look for each and every limitation. Don't get bogged down on if it's uh, not novel in 102, obvious 103. Point being, each and every limitation has to be there. Why? Because obvious this combination, very hard to win on. You want to find something that's not shown in any of the references cited. That's where you win the argument. So, so like if you, if you argue that to your brother, it's obvious, it's not obvious, you're not going to win. But if you argue, he says, it's my ball, you say, no, it's my ball. And you're, you say, there is no ball, the spoon is not real, or whatever it is then you might win that argument or at least divert his attention to a philosophical discussion on what's the difference between real and abstract and have a nice uh, philosophical discussion, which won't necessarily win the argument. But um, I myself, when I tell these things, I get off topic myself because I go philosophical in my head. So what were we talking about? 102 and 103 rejection, you want to stick to the point and stick to each and every limitation that's there or not there. And if and only if there's a proper citation for each and every limitation, that's when I amend the claims. 
Or sometimes, if, even if I don't think it's proper, you might say that, okay, this, this is ridiculous, but if I just pull in the definition of it into the claim that I had in the specification, because I drafted my patent application properly, I pull in the definition of spherical to be a circle, with, or three, a circle which is wrapped around a midpoint in all sides, whatever, to produce a sphere, and now it overcomes the prior art, hey, that works. So you can take limitations from dependent claims, and you can put those in your independent claim. You can add a limitation from your specification. You're basically adding text that you've written before in, in the application to add it in, such as your definitions, such as sub-features, in order to get around it for either one, he's properly cited it in the office action, you need to get around it, or two, because it's just going to be easier to argue if you pull in the definition. Examiners oftentimes, you go head, like anybody, you go head to head with them and you say, you're wrong, it doesn't work. Um, especially not in marital arguments. Uh, but here it also doesn't work. You can't just say you're wrong. You need to find a better way to say it. So just pretend it's like a relationship with your spouse or significant other or whomever. And you say, and instead of saying you're wrong, you say something like, and I'm stealing this from my wife who's a social worker, um, I have a different perspective. You know, <laughs> you want to come at it not direct. You say, I have a different perspective. What if we look at it this way? What if I add this, the, this definition here? And now the examiner can sort of save face and say, okay, that's different. Even though in your mind all you did was pull in the definition that you already had in specification is already what you meant, the examiner will say, okay, that's different. I'll allow it. Yay, let's go with that. And that often does work. Um, in order to say it's different even though you really had the same thing to begin with. Oftentimes I had an attorney who he was not a patent attorney but he went five years on trying to get his own patent issued and he went back and forth the examiner, back and forth, back and forth and he, he, he couldn't get it, he, he couldn't get it. Uh, he eventually hired me, I got it through for him, it took another two, three iterations and we got it through and what the examiner allowed it through on was this like minutia of features of uh, account of the number of times we show something. And, and he said, had I put that through in the beginning, he surely would have rejected it. And in the end, my claims would have gotten something through, would have been very different. To which I said, yeah, that's kind of the way it works. You amend your claims. Sometimes if you can't get something through, you amend your claims in order to sort of placate the examiner and do something different. In this case, the examiner just folded after five years, wanted to get this thing off his docket. Uh, and uh, you'll end up with a very different claim, and unfortunately, that's the nature of it. It's sometimes not scientific, but more emotional and people skills and dealing with the people and how to deal with them and how to get through things that aren't going to bruise people's egos, but in a way that they'll feel comfortable with it and they'll let it through. So there's a lot of psychology involved in this also, which comes to the argument for draft broader claims and after you get the rejection, make them go smaller so then the, the examiner will feel like he won. He'll feel good. When he make him feel good, he'll give you what you want. And you're dealing with the government, that's one of your strongest negotiating abilities. Make the government worker feel good. All right. Um, keep your high level and load of notes in order. Your high level is paragraph of each thing. And now you, your LOTA is the limitation analysis, uh, the limitation office action, uh, the text that he's actually citing, and the analysis to see if it's real, see if it's good. All right, examiner interview. Uh, etiquette and good manners are critical. Again, you want to make the examiner your friend. You want to talk to them about how they dropped their kids off to car in carpool in the morning and got to the patent office at 8 a.m. and so forth. If they're in Detroit, don't mention the economy. They just opened up a uh, uh, patent office. This is his first satellite office. They've opened up in Detroit. Um, I've yet to actually deal with an examiner in Detroit. But you know, you talk about, you talk about. Oh yeah, when I was there, I you know I visited the the spy museum and uh, in in Alexandria and so forth. It, you know, whatever. It doesn't <laughs> always go that way. It depends on the examiner. Some of them get that right down to business. Some of them are fresh off the boat from Vietnam and don't speak English, which is a different problem. The patent office used to actually have, and might still have, a recruitment center in Ho Chi Minh City where they'd recruit engineers from Vietnam. And there's different problems. You kind of need to know who you're dealing with. Um, I found cultural issues to be a big issue sometimes where certain, certain examiners, you know what culture they're from, and if you know things to say and not to say to people of that culture, uh, just in terms of you know, how they deal with people, in terms, terms of uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to get into too specific, but uh, just in terms of dealing with people and how it's going to work with them. Male-female examiner sometimes also makes a difference how you talk to them. 
Um, I tend to have better luck. I don't know why. I thought this would never happen, but I tend to have better luck arguing with female examiners than male examiners. Um, but in any case, uh, but if you give them the give and take uh, of talking to them in person and or on the telephone, and you have direct communication rather than on paper, you can make it personal and you can try and get something through. And you can also, it works the other way too. Sometimes the examiner has a position that you'll look at at the paper and be like, that's just a ridiculous rejection. But when they explain it to you, when they, when they explain it to you and say how they see it, even though usually I come back and still say that's a ridiculous rejection, I see how they're reading it. This is how they're reading it, so now I see what to do. I change the claim like this in order to get around their reading of the claim. Because the fun thing about the English language, or language in general, is it's not always precise. Uh, words, all they are is a construct that we all agree has some meaning. Why does anything mean anything? Uh, so you know, we, we agree in the English language that apple refers to this piece of fruit that is red, and we all kind of agree to that but somebody can read that language or understand it differently. So that's why you have your definitions, and that's why you talk to them to understand, not necessarily the paper words that they're using, but to back and forth to understand how are they seeing it. And that's often critical, because now you know how to respond. Um, there's some people that never conduct examiner interviews, like my case of the lawyer. Uh, he had gone five years. I don't think he ever conducted the examiner interview. I had another case, a medical device. I took over from another attorney. And this other attorney basically said to his client, I'm tired. I can't do this anymore. I'm not getting anywhere with this examiner. And it showed. He never did a discussion with the examiner. Happened to be a very nice lady. And we happened to work it out. Uh, and his, on paper, he was just, you could see it in his words, he was just getting angry. And he would just say, you know, for the fifth time, I said that this does not disclose that, and this is good to appeal, and blah, 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 and it was clear it wasn't getting anywhere because he just gets the examiner's guard up. Um, sometimes it's just you have a fresh face just to have someone new look at it. You know, sometimes I'll have uh, my attorney in Pennsylvania or another attorney does overflow for me. I'll have them a case that I think is clear, but I'm not getting anywhere. I just have them look at it because you have a fresh set of eyes that will hopefully give a fresh perspective on it and look at it differently. All right. So when to have the examiner interview? Have an examiner interview is like voting in Chicago. You have it early and as often as, as many times as you can. OK, that was a joke about the corruption in Chicago. But New Jersey is not much better. New York's probably not much better yet either. Um, Chris Christie has a great biography. I'm a big Chris Christie fan. I have to get politics, because as soon as you say anything, someone doesn't agree with you. But uh, he has a great biography about uh, when he was in the, um, actually someone writing about him, uh, Attorney General's office. He said, finding corrupt officials in New Jersey was just too easy. It was just like shooting fish in a barrel. It's just like they're all over the place. We, we had our sewage, I live in New Jersey, we had our uh, Passaic Valley Sewage Commission that these guys are making like $300,000 salary, storing their boats there, uh, and this just comes off of our sewer, uh, sewer bills, and it was just tremendous corruption. It was everyone's brother and brother-in-law had a job there making $150,000 to $300,000 a year, and meanwhile, we're paying for this. These are unelected officials. And Chris Christie is awesome. Um, he got rid of a lot of that. He put my mayor in jail. I live in Passaic. He put our former mayor and three councilmen in jail. Uh, so anyway, Passaic is another story. It's been corrupt going back 100 years. Uh, my grandparents lived in Passaic. And they said, this is nothing new. It was the same thing when we were there. Um, all right, so the patent office allocates one hour per application for an examiner to talk to you. So. Do, you, you do your homework. So when you do your homework, you're going to use that hour to your, to, to your best ability. Because when you talk to them, I've actually had examiners say, normally people call me and it's just like, we don't do anything, whatever. I've had examiners at just like the end of the call, like, wow, you really knew your stuff. You want to be that attorney. You want to know your stuff when you talk to them. That's in general in life. Unless you're in sales and marketing, um, which I'm going to get opinionated again, uh, you can sort of sell them anything. That's sort of the invention promotion thing. You know, you just want to sell the best aspects of it. But even there, I'm going to retract my statement because even there, if you know what you're talking about, you can sell it a lot better. This is from a person who runs Linux and only buys things on Amazon.com. So I want to read the product reviews before I buy anything. I go through a mall, my eyes just glaze over. Like, why would you buy something here? I have no product reviews. I don't know what it's made out of. I have no idea of quality. <laughs> but anyway, I'm a bit on the nerdy geeky side, which is why I'm a patent attorney to begin with. It takes being a little nerdy geeky and very analytical. Um, so enough about me. Do your homework. Know what you're talking about. 
Uh, be prepared with a claim amendment to discuss. Be prepared to explain the difference because if you can do that, you will have a productive interview and you won't just be wasting your time. You won't just have the, the examiner saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, and be spending half the time looking for the reference where you can cite it. If I have the paragraph number, examiner, look at paragraph 37 in that reference that you cited. It clearly discloses that it can't be a thing which uh, ball selector under the bottom or whatever it is. So basically, know your stuff, know what you're talking about, be prepared, be cordial and friendly, and you'll probably enjoy life more too that way because, you know, whatever. It's fun to go through life happy. Um, writing a response. Yes, we have a question. We have our first question. You Thank ever, you. Do you ever record, tape record your interviews? And as a litigator who has run up against this problem, why in the world would you not? Huh. I, you know, something that a thought never crossed my mind. Because I've had examiners that will say things in an interview that then will uh, that then will not be correspond to what happens on paper after. But I guess I would fear recording an interview for the simple reason that it can be used also as evidence against you. I mean, I'm happy to talk to you about this after, but that's an interesting thing because some of the things you say in arguing points, you might concede points, and there's things you're saying that when you give up things, and the process of getting the patent is a little different than the process of litigating it. So you might say different things that they'll help you in prosecution that because of the way you said it, you say, okay, I understand that, that, that that's as close as this feature, but what if we amend it this way? And you, then the person's basically say, well, look, your attorney prosecuting the patent gave it up and the examiner agreed. So I'm afraid of creating a paper trail, to be honest with you, but why, 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 why I guess you would disagree with me. So uh, let's hear. Well, if, on both sides, if you're, if you're litigating inequitable conduct or you're litigating claim construction, there, there are a host of reasons why it might be very helpful for the patentee especially to have a record of what actually happened. But doesn't that cut both ways? If you it, can it figure does. out your claim construction based on what was said, then it might hurt you because you said something or it might help you. So I would think it's a it net go even both ways, but, but you know, if you've ever had to take a deposition of an examiner and the lawyer who had the interview, it would be a lot more helpful to have, it, have a precise record. Interesting, because examiners will say something different in the deposition. Right. I, I would buy that, yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure that happened. I've, I've had some crazy cases where I just luckily was out one day and I missed a phone call from the examiner where he wanted to change something. And because it was his last day, it was, now they have hard deadlines at the patent office, he allowed it to go through that way. And I can imagine the examiner's deposition, and he said, no, that claim should never have been allowed. Well, I don't think he would say it that far because that also can hurt him, but <laughs> you know, I can imagine they, they might say some different things. But anyway, any other questions while we pause here? All right, so we have a half hour left, so we're going to talk about writing a response to an office action. So your response is basically going to consist of four parts, which is usually three parts, which is usually two parts that really matter. One is your cover sheet is saying, hi, this is a response to an office action, I'm filing it, and blah, blah, blah. This is the bibliographic information. Part two is the amendments to the office action. Uh, I'm sorry, amendments to your claims. You can also do a, sometimes they'll object to something in your specification, your drawings, you amend your drawings, you amend your specification. Again, you cannot add new matter. But once you do that, you don't always have amendments to the claims. Then you have your arguments. Part three is your arguments where you basically take everything you did in your LOTO analysis and you copy, paste, edit, paragraph format. And just like, uh, since everyone here went to law school, just like you had the, uh, man, what was it called? I don't do any legal, re legal writing. What was the method called, the legal writing they taught in law school? IRAC. IRAC. Issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. This is basically another form of that. Except your issue is your limitation. Your rule is, the rule is here, since we're not arguing a statute, we're arguing what's said in the office action. Your rule is now really what they cite in the, uh, what they say in the office action. Uh, your, and then your analysis is going to be really the analysis from the previous uh, reference that they're citing. And the conclusion is really, does that match up or not? OK, I called analysis step four because the thing that always bothered me about IRAC is that uh, the conclusion really doesn't matter. It's all kind of analysis. But anyway, so I put in a thing there of your examination first, the text of it. OK, so here's the cover sheet. I took out some of this information, although it's actually public data, so I really don't even need to. The heading block, state what it is. This is a response to the office action. And each thing starts on such and such a page. As you do electronic filing, and they separate this out in the electronic system anyway, I don't know that this matters, but it's been tradition. 
So <laughs> we do it. This is what the first page looks like. I'd rather just do it than have a problem later over something silly like that. Interview summary if you have one. I it's a good idea. We thank Examiner Sotomayor for the telephone interview on this day, and we appreciate the extra effort, and just blah, blah, blah. Thank you again here. Despite the technical problems, you talked to me, and it was so wonderful and great. You know, uh, it doesn't hurt to make them feel good. If you, say, if you say to a person, thank you, it was great, even if they know you're full of it, they tend to still believe you and still be affected by it regardless. Um, again, uh, if I haven't made anything more clear, I prefer substance over all of this stuff, but it does help to have this nice stuff around the edges. Um, my wife's family, for example, is the, the type that whenever you call on the phone, they say, hi, how are you? And then, and then I'll say, how are you? And they, go into call, they just go into talking because it's a nice formality. Hi, how are you? But nobody seems to ever want to know how you really are. They just say, hi, how are you? And then if you answer or you ask them four times, they'll just go on talking. <laughs> so I don't really understand that one, but that's just my own personal pet peeve of people always saying, hi, how are you? When, you say, when they call you, why don't you just tell me why you're calling? But anyway, this is for an uh, issue which my wife just groans at me. So the claim, submitted, uh, the claim amendment submitted here with is submitted for consideration during the interview. And it was agreed on by both <coughs> parties, and it was overcome rejection. You know, just say what's going on. So you, you create that written record in lieu of a f recording the phone call. You have the written record of what was discussed. It can be used in litigation. You have a proper trail of what happened, and you can hopefully help them stick to their word a little. It's not often, but I have had examiners backslide on me. I don't know if it's intentional or not remembering, but suffice to say, I was not happy, nor was my client. Use status event identifiers on the amended claims. Uh, original, currently amended, withdrawn, canceled. So this one, where I've changed it, you see you underline what you've added, and you strike through what you cross out. You can use double brackets. There we go. That's the international sign for double brackets, because I just made it up. Uh, you can use that if it's five letters or less. Sometimes it's just plain old easier than going to the strike through in your word processor. OK, remarks. This is you state what's going on. You state what the office action said succinctly. Claim 11 through 14 have been rejected under 35 USC 102 as being anticipated, meaning it was shown in one reference by this 2006 reference. Arguments are provided below to overcome this rejection. The office action is further restri restricted. Examination claims 11 through 14. Applicant traverses this rejection. Traverse is the uh, patent attorney way of saying, I disagree with your rejection and I'm going to provide arguments. So what's the rejection under? 35 U.S.C. 102. Allowance of certain claims, not here, not put it in. Restriction, put that in, and state what you're doing. We are going to argue it. Are we going to amend the claims? We are going to do both. This is just your roadmap for laying it out for the examiner so they don't get your office action and be like, oh, this is too much. I'm too overburdened. Reject, reject, reject. You want to actually lay it out, make it simple, make the job nice and easy. Um, give you a corollary example. I had an example where uh, before I was an attorney, uh, I was helping someone through immigration, and we went to another attorney, and we had all our documents all over in a pile and whatever. And the, the, attorney, the, the immigration attorney said to us, buy yourself a nice binder, get those lucite pages, or whatever they're called, the see-through pages, put them all in in the order that you're going to need them, so you flip through and show it to them. Show your professional, show it's proper, and it looks a lot better. I don't know whether that made the difference or not. I don't think it did, but it, go, it, it, it helps. It helps to do everything professional where they can see it, make your arguments logical, make them as concise as possible, and so forth. So this, is, this was actually the written write-up. We're going back to that ball selector again. So first, we have a paragraph on our patent application. Claims 11 through 14. Notice I didn't talk about the whole patent application. He's examining 11 through 14. Focus down on the important part because he's not going to read too far if you start talking about kitchen sink, even though your patent in your disclosure, if you remember back, should cover the kitchen sink. But we're going to focus down on the rejection here. Claims 11 through 14 are directed towards a spherical ball with interior transponders for the removable. Cite the paragraph, 39. This prevents the ball from getting lost by rolling away. As I explained about it, working against a trivial motion is further as recited in paragraph 39. Uh, and so forth, and I quoted it. Citations and quotes are your friend. Make it look real, otherwise they're going to say, that's nice, it's not in the office action, or they're just going to be too lazy to look it up. Nobody wants to do more work than they have to. Um, I shouldn't say nobody. There are some people, but we call them masochists. Um, and then the next one, US 2006 slash blah, blah, blah to Edo is directed towards balls that are made of translucent resin of different colors. Paragraph 54, such as red, green, and yellow with an RFID tag. 
Figure three in the reference shows the R fit. Why am I going to figure three? Because that's the important part. That's the part I want to focus down on. Figure three, if you remember, was the ball where it showed this like tablet looking thing in the middle. So because of that, no reference has been located stating whether th this thing is hollow or solid or that the RFID blah, blah, blah. So why did I go to that? Because you could read these two paragraphs, and hopefully the examiner could read this before he even gets to the claims, and he could be like, wow, good argument. And, we, and once he gets to the claims, then hopefully his mind has already been swayed. Because if he's read this, this is plain English. He doesn't have to get into too nitty gritty. I cited paragraph numbers. He can quickly flip open my patent application, and he can see, or whatever, the computer, and he can find paragraph 39. It really does say that. It really does say this. And he can flip open the other one, and he can jump right to figure three. I've made his job very easy. But wait, there's more. I make it easier than that. We'll get to that after the next part. Actually, let's jump to it. Okay, I should see this in the water. Okay, 102 court case with legal test. Now, this is kind of silly, but you should actually state in your response what is the law. 35 U.S.C. 102 says that the four corners of a single prior art document describe each and every element of claimed invention. Now, it seems silly you have to put this in. I imagine most examiners wouldn't even bother to read this. They'd skip through it. But if you're a new examiner and you have, I don't know what it is, a six or eight hour course before you, you have a supervisor who has to prove your stuff, but before you start doing your work and they're all overburdened, your supervisor's overburdened, <coughs> they might not have realized exactly the extent of 102 or it might just serve as a reminder. So reject, reject, hopefully they'll have in their head what it is. Same thing with 103. We cite the, the Bilski case on obviousness. That's the latest test. Uh, and we go from there. So anyway, this you can find these on websites and looking at other people's office. I just copy them. All right, then here is the loda for each limitation. So we go through the analysis, and basically what I've taken is my notes where I've gone through each limitation, and I've done copying and pasting because it's all sort of prepared, but now I've sort of formulated because that was sort of my initial draft, so to speak. And now after I've talked to the, after I've showed it to the client, and talk to them about what I think is good. I actually highlight the parts where I think are good arguments. I say, here, jump to this, jump to this. And then after I've talked to the examiner, I might modify my, my work a little and so forth. Then we do the write-up. Here's the limitation. Claim 11 is directed towards a plurality of balls at, uh, with each ball having a generally spherical encasement with hollow interior. The office action states as is shown in ETO as follows. I quoted it. It shows it's this, this, and this paragraph. As it was cited above, figure three fails to show the spherical encasement is hollow. Rather, the r fit tag appears to be held at a central plane, implying that the ball is solid. No text has been located within the written specification one way or the other. Now, I didn't say here, Edo absolutely positively does not disclose this. I wouldn't get anywhere, because he'd say, yeah, it does. And I also didn't want to say something that, in litigation, would be torn apart. Because maybe it is disclosed somewhere. Now I've got a malpractice issue, because I've said something false. So I'll just say, I haven't found it. It's much, it, and I do this in search reports also. I, I, I'll, unless I'm totally sure, I'll never say in a search report, this prior art reference doesn't show a ball. I'll say, I haven't found any reference in it. Because unless I've read the thing cover to cover twice and my eyes didn't glaze over in the 50 page document anywhere, uh, then I don't know for sure. So I'm just going to say, and I find it's much better just to be honest and truthful rather than trying to put forth ridiculous arguments or put forth stronger arguments than need be because you have much more credibility if you're honest. I mean, I've had to the point where I've had clients come in my office and one particular client, I said, this is not worth doing a patent for. Uh, you, can, you can guess which one it is because it's issued on my website, patentlineway.com. Uh, but he then went and shook my hand and said, I'm going to hire you. So why are you hiring me if I told you don't bother? And he said, because I went to five attorneys and everyone else tried to sell me and what a great idea it was. You're the only one that said not. This is like all the New Age Cinderella movies where instead of everything being wonderful at first glance, Cinderella or the guy don't want each other or something and he says, I don't like your, your hoity-toitiness. And then he says, oh, I like you because you're the one that's, <laughs> uh, whatever. You're, you're the one that's uh, not trying to go after me for the wrong reasons. So if you're just honest, first of all, you get more business that way. Second of all, you can sleep better at night and have a better conscience about it. And third of all, the arguments I think work better because they don't just say, okay, this person's trying to pull a fast one. They really don't have substance here. I'll just say, look, I haven't found it. Here's the substance. Here's where the, this, this reference is lacking in the substance. You know, it depends. I'm obviously, for a presentation, I'm pulling out what I think is one of the ones that went you know, really well, and this one issued into a patent. 
doesn't always work out as, as well as this for various reasons. Some examiners reject, 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 no matter what you do. Uh, but anyway, the, this is how you do it. And in the end, um, and so withdraw the rejections, early acceptance, all claims is allowed, uh, is requested, please allow the claims, here's my signature, and then eventually you get this. Eventually you get U.S. patent, there's the cover sheet of it, uh, patent 8,128,089, and you can see if you zoom in on the, that, that, or if you look at it on my website, you'll see it says, attorney Michael J. Feigen, so you can see I actually did prosecute this thing, and my name is signed on all the documents. And uh, you can see there's the claims, which I've blown up on the right-hand side, which is your plurality of balls usable for a ball selector. Each ball is said plurality of balls comprising, and so forth. There's claims uh, 10 through 14, which I think the claim numbers change slightly. Once they publish it, I might have deleted a claim or something, so the claim numbers change a little. Um, how do you respond to an examiner's continued Use, use that sh he or she takes official notice that limitations and dependent claims are old and well known in the art as a basis for rejection. Okay, claims. so official notice is basically where an examiner will say, I haven't actually found this in any reference, but I take official notice that such a thing is well known and done before, and since it's well known and done before, I'm not giving any credence to this. Uh, it depends. It, it, if you have better arguments, make the better arguments first. It's usually on dependent claims, not independent. And it depends if they're good or not. Sometimes, you know, they are good. They'll say, like, using a wireless device to transmit stuff is old and well known. Other times, it's sort of ridiculous. It's sort of they ran out of time to search. So you can point it out, and you can stay, say, state with particularity where it is. Uh, you can say, I disagree. I don't recall the site offhand, but you can but look it up. The easiest way to look anything up is not through books anymore. It's to go into Google and you type in MPEP uh, official notice, and you will find the MPEP section on official notice. And look at it. State the rule. It's copy and paste out of the MPP, the Manual of Patent Examination Procedure, and say these are the requirements. Find out for yourself, does it meet these requirements? If not, then just go through it again, same thing line by line, and find out where it doesn't meet those requirements, or find other patents, find in the prior art where it wasn't obvious to do, and you can make such arguments, but it, again, usually those come to obviousness type arguments, whether it's obvious to combine with something, and uh, they are difficult. Um, uh, it, it, it really depends on the specific one, but most of the time in, in, my, uh, in my history, the official notices have been at least plausible. Even if I wasn't happy with them, they were usually pretty decent. Okay, we got the next question. Sure. Do you know of any adverse consequences of the first to file system on patent applications that are filed after March 16th that claim priori priori to provisional filed prior to March 16th? I was kidding. I don't have more slides. I thought I had another example. But in any case, uh, yeah, so the question about whether you file after March 16th, oh, I'm sorry, claiming, pro claiming priority to a provisional? Right. So what I've heard is the problem with that is claiming priority to a, if you file an application after March 16th, where it goes by filing date, not by invention date, then what, what happens is uh, if you're claiming priority to a provisional, it's only if what was what you're, uh, what you're saying was invented first was in the provisional. So what happens is provisional applications tend to be narrowed down applications. They tend to be subsets of applications because you're filing a full and proper application. You'd probably do a non-provisional anyway. So you disclose more in the non-provisional. Provisional just has to enable a person of ordinary skill in the art to carry out the invention. A non-provisional has many more requirements. It's much bigger. So the problem is if something is in your non-provisional that wasn't in your provisional, then being able to swear behind a reference even though your provisional was before, is only going to work if it was in your provisional. The counter argument to that, the problem with that is that's the case anyway because it's a year before your filing date. Uh, if your provisional didn't have it, they could make that sort of argument anyway. But in order to avoid legal issues, lawyers tend to like to be cautious. So we say, hey, just file it ahead of time and file it early in the morning tomorrow if you can because the system is expected to crash by about 11.09 if I take the median bets for when the system's going to crash tomorrow when everyone files. Uh, do, you think, uh, do you think a provisional patent is enough to prevent a uh, major corporation from kind of swooping in and doing something different and hoping to wind up just you know, litigating you until you're nauseous? Um, major corporation will litigate until you're nauseous anyway. Um, <laughs> they have tons of money and they don't want to give in to this type of, sort of thing because then they develop a reputation for that and it becomes harder for them the next time. Um, 
it, it's it's kind of like this. The further along you are, the better the position you're in. So if you have a provisional, then that's something, but it's not taken nearly as seriously as a non-provisional. And the fact is, many people file provisionals, they're garbage, or they don't go forward with a non-provisional to begin with. Uh, so it's, they're not taken nearly as seriously. If you have to, you file them, but I tend to steer people towards filing non-provisionals. And obviously, best is to have the issued patent, and even better is to have five issued patents around different parts of it. Um, but money talks, and when you're doing litigation, uh, it's, this is more a question for the gentleman behind you, but uh, he who has the most money is the one who's been able to do this, and patent litigation is very expensive. Is, is, is there any sort of other protective mechanism you can use as you're, use, as you're entering the provisional stage uh, to sort of mark your place until you do are ready to go into the full-fledged path? So you can use, so the question is, can you, what other things you can you do to protect beyond the provisional? And you can use, you can and should use confidentiality agreements where you can. If you're disclosing to a big company, they're not going to sign a confidentiality agreement for the simple reason that they may be concurrently developing it or had some research or develop something like that 15 years ago. And then if they decide to move forward on it, you sue them for stealing their idea and they just want to avoid the litigation. So they're generally not going to use it. But if you can get a confidentiality agreement with whomever, with, um, for example, your manufacturer, they'll, they'll tend to sign them without a problem. They should. You don't want your manufacturer stealing stuff. Um, that's really the only other way. I mean, the other things you can do is, I didn't talk about design patents today, but design patents are another type of patent, which there's issues filing with the utility in terms of term, because the term of them is 14 years from date of issuance instead of 20 years from date of filing. So there's issues with losing term, but that is a, you can get those usually within about a year uh, in order to get protection at least on how your thing looks. So like this clicker thing, you could get a design patent on this relatively quickly to get how it looks so someone can't just take it to China and knock you off. Nintendo does it with all their game controllers, so they're just not knocked off. It's just a very easy way to protect them. Uh, copyrights protect your artistic work. So if you have any literature, any type of things like that they might steal from, do the copyright. And trademarks really, well, only protect you for the name, not for the concept of functionality. Uh, and um, trade secret is really confidentiality agreements keep the trade secret. And those are your four types of intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secret. Design patents, uh, the way the process works for that is very different. Design patents only protect the look of a functional object. So the concept of this thing having this cool laser pointer, I'll shine this into the camera, is gonna, I won't shine into the camera. So it has this cool laser pointer. So if you're the first person to put a laser pointer on this, you might do a, um, uh, a, a patent on a clicker thing with a laser pointer, uh, and that would be your utility. But the design patent is just how the thing looks. It protects how it looks, and what you do is really, this, the write-up is really only describing the drawings. And you claim, you have one claim that just says, I claim the thing how it looks in the figures. And you provide the figures show, so you can show all sides. It's black and white line art drawings that you submit. So in the black and white line art drawings, they're also two-dimensional. They don't submit 3D CAD drawings, which I think would make everyone's life easier. Uh, you submit generally a top view from here, the bottom view from here, a el side elevation view from here, and since each of these sides are different, we'll submit this side, back side, this side. And then since you want to see depth, so we would show like one coming at it from an angle here, and one coming at it from an angle here, and maybe these if you want to be extra careful. And you show those views, so from these pictures you can get the 3D concept of what the thing actually looks like. And then the only time I've ever had a rejection on a design patent is because something's wrong with the drawings. Uh, it's usually relatively minor once I had it major, and that's when I fired the draftsman and found a new draftsman, because they shouldn't be doing that. If you get a draftsman that knows what he's doing, uh, there's, there's guys that just specialize in drawings for patents, and they will do, th it's really the only way to do it is 3D CAD drawings today, because they are so exacting, and every figure has to be the exact same. It's like they, they go through with a magnifying glass, and if one line is off on one of them, they'll give you a problem. So you want to get 3D CAD drawings made, and have them produce the 2D drawings from that so they're exact. And I've never had a substantive rejection on a design patent. The reason for that is very simple. Design patent is based on how it looks. So unless there's something else that looks the exact same or really close that it's uh, Egyptian goddess is the name of the case, uh, that it, it really has to look very similar as the ordinary observer, it's ordinary observer test that thinks it looks the same. So unless it looks like the ordinary observer thinks it's the same thing, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, Gene Quinn, I actually heard in a talk who I referenced before, uh, he is another patent attorney. 
he, he said he thought like 40% of design patents are probably invalid because there's so many that are just filed and there's no real substantive way to examine them because you have to compare pictures to pictures. Uh, but in any case, they're a simple tool, uh, much more inexpensive. Um, in my experience, have always gone through as long as done properly uh, in order to just get some limited quick protection on something. And I don't recommend doing it only unless it's the only thing you can do, but I would do it in addition to the utility patent as some extra protection. Uh, yeah. If you do a design patent, uh, if you file a design patent, is that, in a sense, limiting the extent of your other patent to this particular design? Perhaps if you had a bunch of different ideas about what it may look like or how it may uh, feel in your, in your hands eventually? Um, I mean, that's possible. It's possible if you file something, you're limiting yourself for later things because, and that's also with a utility patent. Anything else you later file has to be new and unobvious. And unless you find continuation from your earlier filed patent, then that prior reference can serve against you in one or two ways. Either they'll say it's obvious from that or they'll, they'll give you a terminal disclaimer where they'll say the life of your first patent was 20 years and you filed it in 1999, you're filing another one and it's obvious over what's there. So we'll give this to you, but only for the remaining term of your first patent. So you only get the remaining 10 years on it or so, or eight years. What year are we into? Less than that, we're into 2013 already. Um, but with design patents, it's generally, you don't have to change that much for a design patent, which is why you can file many design patents for different things with minor variations. And not only that, since you can file uh, many variations and you can get lots of design patents, it's also not that broad of protection because it's easy for someone to change theirs to work around what yours is, which doesn't mean they can't sue. You can sue for anything and make the case, but it becomes difficult. I mean, I dealt with a case with a hairbrush where former licensee had a new hairbrush, which I honestly thought looked different enough. It was sort of the same shape, but it looked totally different, how they aligned the bristles and how the alignment of things and the um, um, depth and size of the various parts. And that was really enough in my mind. And the other side just never went forward pursuing further because it's probably not worth the cost for what they were making. OK, what's the next question? What are your thoughts regarding the copyright of a design prior to filing a design patent? This would be used to initiate licensing discussions under a CDA. OK. So a copyright of the design before filing a design patent, uh, if you can do it, why not? You know, if you can help your client by getting it, sure. A copyright office will not allow uh, things which are functional. However, so if things that are functional go to patents. Things that are artistic go to copyrights. However, there's ridiculous overlap there. And this came up, this was questioned a lot in the Bilski Supreme Court case. They actually mentioned design patents because to try and determine the legal test in order to, to make the determination of it. And I actually have uh, New York Times interviewed me. There's a, you can watch the video on my website, patentlawandwhy.com, where New York Times interviewed me about um, Bikram Yoga. He had a copyright on Bikram Yoga that eventually the copyright office said, oops, we didn't mean to give that copyright because that's functional. They're using it as an exercise that's functional. If it's functional, it goes to a patent. Design patents are sort of the thing that nobody talks about, which is the overlap between the two. Why? Because a design patent is the look of a functional object, which it kind of has artistic quality. And I've seen that there's design patents that I don't know if these should have been issued, but I actually saw a design patent for a Band-Aid with an American flag on it that's got a design patent for the American flag emblem on a Band-Aid. Personally, I wouldn't have issued that. That's completely artistic. That doesn't add anything to the... Yeah, it changes the, the look of it, but if you can file a copyright, copyrights never expire, which is a whole different issue. Well, not never, but they expire 70 years past your death. Uh, Walt Disney um, did a lot of lobbying to extend it, the company, in order to extend it so Mickey Mouse doesn't expire. So if you can get a copyright on any portion of it, it's a very inexpensive way to get something. And for negotiations, absolutely. If you can do it, go for it, but you have to find something artistic. Um, I only had one that was ever not allowed where I tried to do the artistic quality inside of pants. They didn't allow that one. I thought it had artistic quality the way it was <laughs> aligned and stuff. But um, I don't know, maybe could have appealed it. But in any case, if you can do it, go for it. Can we tell the client that the design patent is shot down? How would it be shot down? Or if they don't accept it, they don't file it. They don't take, like, for example, your pants would be inside. I mean, it's, it's like, like anything. If it's shot down, you hopefully have a good explanation. Um, I mean, my engagement agreement, as any reasonable 
attorney, which there aren't too many of, but anyway, any reasonable attorney engagement agreement would, would say is, you know, we can't guarantee. There's no guarantee that we file something that gets through. You just get a crazy examiner who rejects no matter what you do. That happens especially utility patents. Design patents, not so much. Copyrights, uh, design patents only really if there's a, again, if there's a problem between the, the figures where they don't uh, line up exactly to show you the same, the object exact from the different perspectives. Uh, but, you know, just be, be prepared. Uh, the worst thing you can do is say nothing. And the worst thing you can do is not answer your phone. That's when you get sued. But if a person has an outlet to talk to you to explain it to them, then that's, u that's usually good. Um, this is more tangential, but in seven years, I have now been sued once for a case which was over $250, where the invoice clearly stated what I was billing for, and the client, for some reason, thought that $250 was going to the government, when it stated clearly on my engagement agreement, clearly on my invoices, that things were separate services, and how I billed, and he didn't answer the discovery requests once I sent them questions, so ad you know, admit that you received the invoice, admit that it said this is going to the government, this for not, admit that you signed the document that said how much was actually going to the government on the document he himself signed. So whatever, that's a crazy case, over $250, <laughs> but that typically, if you t every time I've talked to a client, because rejections happen, patents, you always get a rejection on a utility patent. They happen. You talk to the client, I counsel in the beginning, you will expect a rejection. I put it in writing in my search reports, you will get a rejection on this. Um, and uh, as long as you talk to them and explain it and they know the process, and on my website I have a lot of educational material where I go through, I have a patent guide, patentlawny.com slash patent dash guide. I go through step by step what it's like to work with, with, work with my, my law firm, what each step is, the, what, what to bring in disclosure, what to do with the search and so forth, and go through and say, hey, this is how it is. If it gets a rejection, okay. I've had a client or two not come back that I thought would, but it happens. Uh, it's just a part of life. You get rejections when filing patents, but you, know, you do your homework, and as long as the client's happy, then that, that's good. As long as the client understands and is happy and they know what to expect, then I think that's okay. And at the end of the day, no patent attorney gets 100% of patents through. There's, uh, I've seen statistics on some of these large firms. They tend to range between like 40 to 60%. And it might be for various reasons. It might be the type of clients they have who are willing to spend the money to pursue. Uh, it might be they're not as good. Who knows what? But in general, you know, you're looking at half of patents that don't go through even the big law firms. So if you do it right, you can get above those statistics, but you never get to 100%. All right, uh, any last questions? Okay, um, if anyone would like to send me cat drawings, um, I'll include it on my website next to the, say, Mark Cuban inspired pat cat drawings. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, this has been fun. Uh, thank Lawline for having me and everyone for attending and sending in some good questions. And last year's video, I think it had 200 something uh, people who actually viewed it and paid. I think a lot more viewed it and just for the sake of viewing it, but to get CLE credits, uh, let's see if we can break that number. And thank you for viewing.